which called uh, the name of the process is BioGreen. So I will present to you the process itself and also some uh, performance that we obtain with this process and some uh, properties of the biochar which with, uh, we can produce from this process. So BioGreen is a French company and uh, we also um, have a, a BioGreen US company uh, set up in Indiana in Tippecanoe. So we are involving with BioGreen, we are involving in a thermal chemical conversion. So we can go uh, from uh, to refraction up to calcification. That means that we can produce uh, biocoal, syngas, or pyrolysis and biochar. So that uh, according to the temperature, we will produce more uh, solids, more gas, or more liquid. So this is a brief presentation of the process. So the process is based on the electrical heating screw conveyor. So we have a hopper with a dosing screw, which can deliver a constant flow rate of uh, the feedstock into the reactor. The reactor is heated by the Joule effect directly on the screw. So you have a picture here about a screw which is heated roughly about 900 degrees C. So of course, uh, because of this system, we can easily, uh, and with a lot of uh, uh, accuracy, we can select the temperature of the screw from, of course, room temperature. But what, now we are talking about uh, thermochemical conversion. So if we want to make collector refraction, we can set up 250, 280 degrees in order to have biopole up to 70, 80%. Or syngas, for example, uh, usually we produce syngas at 800 degrees C. And when we want to produce a good biochar around 400, 500 degrees C, we can set up the, the, the temperature we need and the dwell time we need. So the system is continuous, it's compact. We can treat all shapes of a particle because it's just a screw conveyor. So we're running with uh, fibers, powder, uh, chips, leaves, any kind of pellets, any kind of shapes. We have a very high heat transfer coefficient. We are talking about 400, 300, 400 watt per square meter. So the very high uh, heat transfer coefficient makes a short dwell time in the system. We are talking about five to 15 minutes. So short dwell time means also low volume, means more security for the system itself. We are uh, very easy monitoring on the two uh, bottom, I mean two parameters, dwell time, temperature, Low maintenance, the system, the reactor itself is just a screw. There is no heater, no double jacket, nothing. Just the screw itself. We have uh, 10 years experience on this system for pyrolysis. And in a 10 year experience, we usually have just to change some uh, part of the refractory and that's it. Uh, based on this technology, but for um, all kind of application, we have almost 80 units installed in the world uh, and about uh, 14 uh, applications on pyrolysis today. So here you have a picture of a bench type system which is more used for R&D purpose. 30 liters per hour based on 10 meters dwell time which is average dwell time for this kind of process. So here you can see the feeding system, the rotary valve between inlet and outlet the reactor itself, the condenser, and uh, the shark cooler, and the shark container. Uh, this is an industrial system that we have installed recently. Uh, it's able to, uh, to treat two tons per hour of biomass. So exactly the same situation. We have four screws in parallel. And we also have a containerized system. So in the container system, of course, we have a limitation on the space. Uh, in a containerized system, we can have a system which can treat roughly 600 to 800 kilograms per hour, depending on the, on the application and depending, of course, on the density of the feedstock. This is just an example. We, we were talking about torrefaction. So for torrefaction, for example, we can treat and um, we can see here that we have very precise uh, 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 result based on the on the co operating conditions. So you have the, the yield, and uh, the yield is here um, uh, according to the operating conditions, dwell times, and temperature. 
when we are uh, talking about torrefaction, uh, of course, the good thing is we have a high yield usually, and we, we, we use this torrefaction in order to prepare biofuel. We densify the, the, the biomass. But uh, in another way, the, the, the yield of gas is quite low, and the syn gas quality is very low. So it's a very poor gas, and we cannot, we almost cannot recover the heat from the heat of the uh, torrefaction uh, gas. So this is a heat and mass balance based on the biochar production. So when we produce biochar production, we are in the middle range of temperature. We are talking about 500 degrees C. We are not in gasification. In gasification, we will have uh, almost the same quality of the gas, like uh, 11 megajoules per cubic meter, higher yield, about 60 to 70%. That means that one ton in gasification, one ton of heat stuff will give to you roughly 2 to 2.5 megawatt of um, very uh, high CV value for the gas. Here, in, uh, in, uh, when we want to produce biochar, we want to be a, a little bit uh, in a lower temperature in order to also maximize the yield. So here you have a, a rough idea about the heat and mass balance. So if we start with 50% moisture cotton feed, uh, feedstock, we have a dryer. Uh, we can go down to 10% pyrolysis, make the biochar. Then uh, uh, have a condensation. We can separate the oil, and the oil can be used uh, to prepare some bio-based molecule. And we have the sink gas, roughly 30% at 11 megajoules per cubic meter, which can be used for uh, the dry. So we can heat recover. So in this system, I would say that if we want to produce biochar and if we, if we want to uh, optimize the biochar yield, there is, I would say, no space, no room to produce electricity. Because you see that if you want to have a closed system, you see we, we need roughly 800 kilowatt if we uh, take it into assumption that uh, for a conventional dryer, we need a one megawatt to evaporate one ton of water. But here in this system, in order to maximize the bio, the biochar yield, we will produce roughly one megawatt. So one megawatt which we produce will cover the heat that we need to dry the material. Once again, if we want to go to the gasification, the purpose will be to gasify. The biochar will be a byproduct, but the yield will not be so high. This is an overview of the uh, economy of the system. So we, of course, we will not describe all the numbers, but basically uh, you should just read on the right side, which is uh, a two tons per hour system with uh, energy recovery in order to uh, produce the energy needed to dry the system. And then you can see here the cost of the biochar per cubic yard or per ton uh, according to these assumptions and based on the uh, price of the fit. <coughs> So we have um, a lot of experience with a lot of kind of biomass, a lot of shapes, cheese stat, manure, horse bedding, grass, cloves, tobacco. Uh, I, guess I would say uh, almost any kind of biomass we can treat with this process because it's nothing else but uh, just a screw conveyor, basically. So I would like to present to you now some uh, properties that we have from this system. So first, I would say that um, we can roughly say that there is no biochar. Biochar is a real uh, generic uh, term. And if we uh, look in, the, in a very specific view, we can see that almost we have one biochar per feedstock. The biochar is really depending on the feedstock, of course, on the operating condition as well, but very depending on the feedstock. Here you have um, some... Uh, sheet that can present to you some uh, properties of the biochar according to the feedstock. And this is French norm. I don't know what kind of norm you have in the US, but uh, for example, we, we, the NF44551 say that uh, this norm is, uh, is a norm for a soil amendment, pure soil amendment, no nutrient, nothing, just a soil amendment. For 051, it's an organic amendment because of the percentage of nitrogen, which is almost 3%. And, and this is for plants, for example. Plant residue, it's a medicinal plant residue after extraction. 
to buy your shark from this kind of product. Of course, if you look at the chicken menu or DJSAT, you will see a very high uh, quantity of phosphorus or potassium. Um, just to tell you that, of course, depending on the application of the BioShar, we can choose the, the, the feedstock. This is some uh, microscopy uh, uh, photography of the BioShar. So you can see porosity, but you can see that the porosity is re also depending on the feedstock itself, which gives you some very interesting properties. Usually when we are talking about BioShar porosity, we say porosity. But if you look in details, you, can, you have two types of porosity, porosity for water and porosity for air. And this will not give exactly the same quality of the biochar. And you can see here that, for example, the biochar from wood, you have a very high porosity of air, small porosity of water, and which is absolutely the opposite if you are talking about the aromatic plant, for example. So you also have the rate curve, which is the density of the biochar. So once again, if you look at the, some purpose, specific purpose of the biochar, you have to check operating condition, but you have to check the feedstock as well. Another, uh, uh, another example of, about that is uh, the conductivity, for example, of the biochar. Of course, all of those biochar were made absolutely in the same conditions, same equipment, same temperature, same dwell time. Nutrient content, of course, depending on the feedstock also. Um, just to give you an example about the water retention properties, which is, uh, in Europe, it's uh, one of the biggest uh, 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 properties of the biochar that people are, people are looking for. So just to give you a, the, an idea of the protocol, we have a sandy soil, we had 1% of biochar, we mix, we put the water, and if we, pa if we pass the water into the, the, this, uh, this mixture, we can see that with 1% of biochar, we can retain uh, 200, uh, I mean 25%, more than 25% of water by weight. So you can see that the water is holding in the mixture with only 1% of biochar. What is interesting is this. The first effect is the water you can retain in the soil. The second effect is how long does the water will remain in the soil. So you see here that after 10, 10 days, 15 days, you still have 50% of the water you have in the soil into the system itself, and you have to wait almost 30 days after you can recover the uh, humidity of the soil. And finally, the other question could be, okay, what about if it's raining again? This is the answer. So here we made the test with one, two, three steps. And you can see that on the second one, um, we, have, we have lost 15% of the water retention capacity. But just this, this was uh, due to the, the, the change of the density of the soil. But if you look at the third one, we have exactly the same uh, level of water retention. And in all case, you have exactly the same slope. That means the evaporation, the resistance to evaporation remains the same. So this is where we have already installed a biogreen process in the world. So we are in the US, we have in Europe, of course. We are in the Emirates, in um, Israel, uh, Indonesia, and Malaysia. Thank you. Two megawatts thermal means uh, that will be roughly one ton, and one ton is uh, approximately 900,000 uh, US dollars. What's the largest particle size that you can handle in the reactor? Wood chips, uh, 30, 30 to 50 millimeters. But of course, if uh, the, the biggest uh, size you have, and then you, you have to change the dwell time. 
And if you change the dwell time, the productivity, the productivity will, uh, will decrease, of course. But uh, technically speaking, there is no limitation. We had the pitch of the screw is uh, 120 millimeter. Is the torrified wood an end product or an intermediate product? End product. And what do you use it for? Biocore. You uh, densify the energy. If you use biomass, usually if you if you prepare pellet, uh, pellet, pellet biomass, uh, pellets from biomass, you can compact five, six hundred, six hundred fifty kilograms per cubic meter, and then you have uh, it cal a calorific value about eighteen megajoules per kilogram. And if you make torrefaction, you can compact up to 900 kilograms per cubic meter. Then you have a higher density of uh, energy inside. Yeah. What kind of moisture content uh, can you handle? Yeah. Uh, okay. Technically speaking, the only limitation is the screw itself. So if you want to run a, a very sticky product in the screw, like a, a sludge, it will be stick in the screw. Um, so that depends on the product. For a biomass, that can be 30%, 40%. There is no, no limitation. For a manure or, or seaweed sludge, for example, the limitation will be 35% dry matter. But of course, it's the, if you have no limitation, technically speaking, you have a limitation in terms of energy cost because you you will use the payroll laser as a dryer so it's yeah so this is why it's always better to have a dry, as dry as possible it's uh, the system itself it's a, it, it based on the screw on the screw conveyor okay um, okay all right yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So basically speaking, I mean, the patent is based on a screw conveyor, but in a screw conveyor, you have the screw itself is in stainless steel. So if you apply the low voltage, you get intensity because of the electrical resistance of the screw. That's it. Last question. You have two plants in the U.S. What are their feed stocks? Uh, Biosolids for the one in California and uh, the, the the one in Indiana is just a, a, a pilot plant. It's a bench type. You, we can uh, work uh, any kind of uh, biomass. Go ahead. One more. Can, can it be adapted without any access to electricity? <coughs> yes. Uh, I would say, of course, we're producing gas, high quality thing gas, 20 to 30 percent uh, methane content. The only thing, the only problem is the economy. And if you want to maximize the biochar, if you think that biochar will cost, we, the, the price of the biochar will be higher than the price of the electricity, you will not have, it, your, your, your operating condition will make that you will produce biochar and the thin gas that we, you will produce will be, should be used to, uh, to dry your feedstock. Now, if you, if you plan to uh, make electricity and not biochar, we'll say, this is not your first product, then you have to move to gasification, like 800, 900 degrees C. Then the yield of gas is much higher, and then you can start to think about producing electricity as soon as you are able to uh, clean the gas. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.